All right, welcome to Summit Stories. I'm Jonathan Musgrave with Seep Digital. With me today is Brad, uh, Brad in San Francisco. How are you doing, Brad? How's it going? Good to talk to you today. Good. Hey, I'm super excited to have you on here. This is our very first Summit Stories. And the goal of Summit Stories is really this kind of informal video podcast format where we're going to ask advisors questions about their business, their marketing, and their life, just to kind of share an experience with advisors across the country and help each other grow. And one thing, you know, people ask us, who are the type of people that work with Steep most often? Is it big advisors, small advisors, young or old? And I think it's really everyone, but I think the common thread that ties all of our advisors together is it's people who are growth oriented. Typically people who are investing in marketing and actively uh, acquiring clients are people who are growth oriented. And I know that's certainly true for you and your practice. Um, But Brad, first, thanks for being here. And I'd love for you to share just a little bit about your business, uh, what you do at the firm, kind of how you guys are set up and just kind of give people an idea of what life looks like in in your shoes. Yeah, sure. So uh, I'm one of the planners here at Decker Retirement Planning. Uh, We have our headquarters based out of Salt Lake City. It's where we have a lot of our back office staff. And then we have uh, individual offices with one planner at each office uh, in a few different states. So um, the, the, the name of the game for us has been growth, though. Uh, I mean, scaling from where we were four years ago to where we're at today, is uh, it's been a, a, a big effort. Um, but like most financial advisors, had all of our marketing uh, completely turned on its head in the last six months. Uh, so everything that worked before no longer works, or we're not even able to do it. Um, and so having to be really nimble, um, but still trying to produce the same volume to keep those growth metrics up has been really tough. Uh, and so we've sort of been forced to go towards a, a digital only um, platform for marketing. Um, and we were, I'd say we caught flat footed, um, you know, probably like most people. We always knew we needed to go digital eventually and we had all the best practices underway, but as a hundred percent of marketing efforts, uh, we, we definitely had to learn quick. Yep. And that's kind of what Corona did to everybody. I joke with my wife who runs our operations here. I'm just like, we are in reinventing our business on the weekends, trying to you know adapt. And I think that yeah. whether you're an advisor or a client experiencing our marketing, or obviously in our team, it's it's been the same thing. So let's talk just for a second about pre-Rona. Um, what was kind of your primary marketing method before the whole pandemic and the lockdown? Yeah, dinner seminars and referrals. That was the bread and butter. Um, dinner seminars were great. Um, our firm is is uh, definitely falls in the category of more of a, a comprehensive financial planning um, a company. So um, we're not typically just doing individual product sales. Uh, we're actually pulling together a, a, a income distribution strategy for retirees only. Uh, so core clientele is going to be anywhere from fifty five to on the higher end maybe seventy five. Um, and they've got to be folks that can live on their assets. Uh, so it's, it's pretty rare for us to work with people that are um, going to be reliant on just a pension or social security or something because there's just not a lot to plan out there. So um, we're looking for folks that are probably on the higher end of the um, average net worth scale because those are the ones that need the planning. Um, and dinner seminars were a really good tool for us um, because we always treated our um, events as uh, sort of an educational type of workshop. Uh, it wasn't uh, simply pitching one product like a fixed indexed annuity or something. Uh, we, we'd actually walk through our entire process, sort of set expectations up front, um, and then usually a pretty good success rate for people showing up for at least a, a first visit. And the first visit was where we did some initial filtering on our end. Uh, obviously, we encourage people to filter us out if they're not interested. Um, and then we'd engage on a, a, a full planning cycle um, that would go anywhere from you know, two to two to eight meetings typically before we actually bring someone on. And so uh, dinner seminars were, that was, that was what we did uh, once or twice a month um, across each office that we have. Uh, and that, that kept planners calendars nice and full. Mm-hmm. So looking at your webinar schedule and I've, you know, excuse me as I look away, I've got your yeah. guys campaigns pulled up here. I want to say that you personally have done 27 webinars ish. Um, and I think that your office cumulatively has done even more than that. And so I guess what I'm sensing is if you're looking at typically doing, you know, one or two dinner seminars a month, and now you're doing this volume, one of the yeah. early themes I'm spotting here is that you're, you're doing marketing more frequently. And I think that's probably an advantage in one sense, because, you know, you can do this virtually. It doesn't take you away from your family in the evening, but on the other hand, yeah. maybe the yield per event's a little bit different. So, you know, maybe if you can talk just a little bit about, you know, how does the, you know, the scale of this and the frequency of it, how does that differ from what you're used to with doing physical events? 
Yeah, I mean, everything about digital with scales holds true with digital marketing for uh, our office. I mean, you have way more eyeballs. Um, and so I'd say one of the biggest benefits that we've had is, is we're sort of viewing this marketing, um, the digital marketing as a building up of our list. Uh, when you have 20 households at a dinner event at Ruth's Chris, um, that's great. You get 20 emails, maybe 40 emails on a good night. Um, but when we're marketing and we have 120 people register for an event or 50 people register for an event, and that's just the one, uh, we're able to grow our marketing list a lot faster. So the scale is really great. Um, the other thing that I'm really liking is just seeing what it's going to look like in the future. I, I keep telling my clients that I feel like all of our marketing and all of our planning and all of our technology has been brought forward five years. Mm -hmm. I always knew that this was the direction that we'd have to go um, to compete with the robo advisors and um, you know, the big banks and the big brokerages. Uh, we knew we'd have to start to reach audiences through a digital platform to be more efficient. Um, dinner seminars worked, but I, I just sort of felt like there's going to be an end to that at some point in the future. So um, I, I'd say that the, the, the scale has been there. Um, the number of eyeballs we get has been there. I would, I would say on the, on the other end, though, um, some of the things that have been a big struggle is just the quality, um, the, the, the ability to identify folks that, and filter uh, the, to the a niche that we focus on and that we feel we serve best um, is been really tough. I mean, it's just a wide open, super wide net. Everyone come in, listen to us. And well, I've always sort of prided ourselves on helping anyone that comes through our office, um, whether they're a fit for us or not, um, is, is something we determine pretty quickly. But we always are going to give sound fiduciary financial advice to anyone that gives us a call or comes through. I've just been doing that a lot more since the mm -hmm. digital marketing effort. And um, you know, even in, in some cases, just building that rapport has been the rapport and um, sometimes people leave reviews after just one meeting and they feel like they've been given, a, a, you know, a, a hope or, or they're excited about finally taking control of their finances. Um, that's actually been kind of an unplanned benefit to go off on a tangent there, Jonathan. Um, yeah. Getting um, positive reviews um, from people that might not even be full-time clients, but just really liked the interaction they got um, has been an area of our digital marketing or social, social media marketing that um, I think has benefited from the wide scale that we've got. Even if the quality has been a lot lower, still getting people to be able to write a nice thing about an engagement that they had with me, um, even if they didn't become a client has, has been a plus. So we've been yeah. really trying to push that online presence a bit. So anyway, ask, maybe ask another question. I'll, I'll get focused again on what that is. No, that's good, man. I think is. that's the goal of this is just kind of have this organic conversation. Just to dive in and ask a quick follow-up on that. When you talk about getting reviews, what format is that coming through? Are you pushing people to a Google review, to a Facebook review? How are you collecting Yeah. That? Yeah. I mean, uh, I, organic is the best. Um, and so when, when people say, well, wait, you're not charging me anything for this. Uh, and just say, you know what, look, if you've had a good experience, if you think that we, this is some value and you think other people would benefit from it, feel free to leave us a, a review anywhere online. Um, the honest review is what's most important there, but um, obviously we'd hope for the positive ones. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, online positive reviews and then also sharing with their friends. I, I've had more than one person come through that wasn't a fit for, for my office, um, but that said, hey, I have my brother who uh, he, I told him what we talked about and what you said was so different that he actually wants to talk to you. So I've had that happen a couple of times. So getting the, um, it, it's just the, the benefit of getting that scale of, of the number of eyeballs watching, uh, listening to our message and, and um, uh, realizing that there's something neat that we have and even if it's not a fit for them, getting them to either vouch for us in a public uh, public space with a review on Yelp or on uh, Google. Google is probably the most common one, I'd say. Um, and then also through referrals. Uh, and, and even seeing people come back three or four months later, um, uh, three or four months later from the marketing, from the mailing list that we have, um, that one's also been nice. I mean, just keep going back to that. It's probably been the best part of having more of a digital focus is just getting that mailing list a lot bigger. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think show up rate on webinars is a challenge. I think nationwide and not nationwide, but really industry wide when people drive cold traffic, not referral emails, um, but like cold traffic to new leads and they invite them to webinars that show up rate, the industry average uh, nationwide is about 16%. Okay. Um, our show up rate, it's going to range and even regionally where you're at in California is going to differ. 
um, just to give everybody a little bit of insight, our all time total of attendance rate is 40%. Um, this summer, we saw that dip down just a little bit down to 35%. Our running 30 day average right now is 37%. And Which, so, by the way, Jonathan, I want to say that's been normal for marketing, even for seminars. Um, people go on vacation in July and August, so that's not surprising at all to see a dip like that. Um, I don't know how much seasonality you build, you'd look into those numbers, but that's quite common. And then come September, October, things really pick up. Absolutely. And we've seen that carry over from not just our physical events, but even to webinars now. Yeah. Um, but I think that the benefit there, and I know you guys are doing this, is, you know, building that list is one of the most valuable assets you have because your next prospects are, you know, maybe all you have from them right now is an email address. Right. Maybe we'll stay present with them. What sort of things do you guys do to try to engage, let's just call it your old and cold list of people who mm -hmm. don't show up or don't engage and you've got these follow up contacts for them? Yeah, um, with a mailing list, it's pretty passive. I mean, we have a great marketing team that, that does a good job of keeping people up to date with what's going on uh, with our firm and, and just interesting news. So we have a, a formal newsletter that goes out uh, weekly to our, the entire list. I try to keep that content valuable and up to date and, and um, pertinent to what people would be interested in. Uh, and then we also have another marketing venue that we use that's just email uh, th through email for um, supposed to be mainly for just clients, but we'll use it strategically for um, people that are in the old and cold list uh, to, to re-engage. Say the thing that's produced the most value um, from reaching out to the list is just a direct reach out. So when there's someone in that first meeting that I have with them that uh, I know I want to, to bring back that maybe just went cold or they were busy and then they fell off the calendar or rescheduled, um, and then said, you know, don't call me, I'll call you. Mm -hmm. uh, being able to reach, keep a list of those high priority clients, you know, it's a couple dozen of them maybe, um, and be able to send them targeted, uh, and by targeted, it's just reaching out and giving them a personal note um, for a reason of why they might want to re-engage and, and just to let them know that we're there. Yep. I think that's a huge part of this is, you know, marketing is a funnel and it's big at the top and small at the bottom for a reason. Yeah. You have people that are way at the top and people way at the bottom, but you've also got this big chunk of people in the middle. And so yeah. I think having a strategy to try to engage all those people is really important. Right. Uh, one of the things I, I know that all of our listeners and your fellow advisors are really going to benefit from is just talking about maybe one of the biggest challenges we've had since Rona, which is, and that's the official term for it over here at Steve. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Or Rona. <laughs> or yeah. Rona. Um, but I think one of the biggest challenges we've encountered and advisors have encountered is how do we do this whole thing virtually? I mean, you and I are sitting down here on a Zoom call, and this is probably what, you know, a lot of your day is like when you're meeting with clients. Mm -hmm. um, just in general, how has that transition gone? And maybe a good follow-up to that would be, what are you doing in your meetings now that you weren't doing four months ago? And how have you kind yeah. of through this virtual sales process? This one is an area that I think about all the time. Uh, and that because the planning phase at our firm is so important, it's not... It's not the first sales pitch from a 15 minute phone call. That's the most important. It's not the first meeting where I, you know, start to get their interest. It's like, I have to keep people engaged for a really long time mm -hmm. and digital it's, it's kind of two sides. It's, it's lower commitment. So people aren't driving an hour from up North up here in Sonoma down to my office in downtown San Francisco. So it's a lot less commitment from people to be able to just hop on a Zoom call. Plus, I think that some of the people I'm talking to just want to talk to someone. I've had that kind of weirdly more than once, had people where they're super engaged and want to keep meeting and keep meeting and keep meeting, but then when it comes time to actually become a client, they kind of fall back behind the scenes. So they just sort of liked the conversation, which I, I, so I think about that one every once in a while about what that means. You need to be a little um, less likable, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Um, well, so they, um, so, so getting people to get on the call, it's really been this barbell. You, you get some people that are going to, you don't really get much in between. Um, you get some people that fall off because they're not used to a digital engagement. They don't really get the value of it. And it's, it's people that I normally would have had a really good rapport with, um, in person, they're going to fall off and that's always a bummer. And, and, but that said, I, I still think that there's, a number of people that are going to come back once things get a little bit more normal. Um, but you get a lot of those that fall off, but then I get quite a few um, that do just keep going and we keep talking and we keep talking. And like I mentioned before, we have probably an abnormally long planning process almost to a fault. But um, the bigger problem that I'm seeing is that 
with a long sales process, digital environment only takes longer. Um, you can't connect as easily on the same level um, to move the ball forward. Um, you end up having to repeat things or possibly things don't stick as well because you don't have the same visuals. You don't have the same dialogue just in person, um, table reading. So that's been a really hard one is a process naturally gets longer. I'd also say shorter meetings are preferable. I'm not the best at this, but um, there's other plans that are firm that are really good at keeping a nice short meeting to keep it um, valuable and, and uh, just like one hour or so. I'm generally going to go beyond that, maybe hour, hour and a half. But it always feels like people are pretty engaged. Um, but I am noticing the more I do this that you're you start to notice a bit of a fatigue set in um, once the planning process starts to really drag out, even though there's things I have to get done. Um, and it does require a longer planning phase um, to get to a final recommendation. Uh, you just, I'm starting to notice a bit of a fatigue there. So I say I haven't done enough um, on the getting adapted to a digital environment from a like tablet integration with drawings and all those things that I should do that I would do in my office. I um, haven't quite figured that one out. So just getting people to log into Zoom, talk to them and share my screen is generally what we're doing. A lot of room for improvement though. I've just started to draw on the documents that we give them to, to kind of write things down and circle areas. Um, but I think uh, that there's some really good videos out there about how to engage better from a, a digital venue like this um, than we're currently doing, or at least that I'm currently doing. Mm -hmm. One of the things you guys are doing that other advisors aren't that I think is kind of cool. And it's, you know, one of the things that digital and virtual meetings kind of affords us is this ability to market beyond your office. And mm -hmm. so when you're doing dinner seminars, you're doing yeah. things at the local and you mentioned people driving an hour from Sonoma to San Francisco, that may be about yeah. as far as you're able to get people typically away from home um, for you. But you know, one of the things that is, it's like a cheat code with digital is when we expand our audiences and have large audiences, it yeah, makes right. getting people registered and just driving the traffic across it is so much better. And so, I mean, that's kind of a cool thing, but I know that I mean, all of your meetings are virtual. So does it really matter to you whether somebody is 30 minutes down the road or in another state? Uh, is that process fairly the same? Do you find that people perceive you differently? Um, how's that kind of like bigger audience? Yeah. Going for you? I put that as a, as it's part of the SWOT analysis. It, it's definitely an opportunity. Um, Cause if you think about, it kind of depends on how you view your business for, for us, we generally are on the side of going really deep rather than really wide. Um, if, if someone has a practice that's really wide, meaning they need a lot of conversation and a lot of conversations, maybe smaller transaction size, uh, digital is a godsend. I mean, it's got to be a great way to engage with many, many, many people. Um, and maybe a lot of them aren't going to be a fit, but you're going to find a lot more people. Uh, and yeah. so it keeps a, a nice, uh, a really wide, lot of people that you can contact. Um, I'm sort of mixed. Um, at this point, I think that our practice is done better in person for at least this generation. And so I'm very excited to be able to get back to just marketing to the Bay area and getting people to come through. Now, I do think that at some point of digital marketing is going to be the direction that this needs to go, which is quite exciting from an opportunity standpoint. The idea of being able to work from a home office, have people come through if they wanted to, um, but be able to market to adjacent areas that I'd like to target. I mean, even in California uh, would be great, but even in the neighboring states. I mean, I've uh, brought on, you know, I have clients in New York that just happened to come across some of our digital media and, and brought him on. Uh, so it's a really, really great client. Uh, so the idea of not being limited to a 30 or 40 mile radius of my office would be great. Uh, I still find though that being able to connect with people on a geocentric level so just so when people know that i'm here we're experiencing the same fire we're experiencing the same uh economy and the same politics and uh talk about school districts and you know all the things that matter to people in their area um there is a certain bond that's tough to replace with just a financial sales pitch um so that i i'm kind of mixed it's definitely an opportunity um uh, but I, I think there's, there's, there's room to explore that a bit more and it, it's, it would be really neat to be able to expand marketing without any borders whatsoever. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, another program that you guys are doing fairly frequently is the women's retirement roadmap. And 
just for those of you who haven't been exposed to it or heard about it before, the, the goal is to just show how women's retirement need to be different than men's. And, you know, we all know the statistics, women typically live older than men. I think there's yep. like a 75% chance that women are going to be fully responsible for their finances. If the spouse predeceases the wife, then there's going to be a built-in tax hike when you go from filing joint to filing single. You're going to lose a social security benefit. There's all of these different right. things. And so I think that we understand the need um, to speak directly to the needs of women. But I think right. one of the biggest questions I get, Brad, when we're talking about marketing to women is this is a male dominated industry. And certainly we have women clients, women advisors who do well with this. Um, but what have you found? Uh, I think maybe there's two challenges here. What have you found a, as a man marketing specifically to women and how do yeah. you kind of cross that moat? And then second of all, I think that you may encounter these challenges where you start this discussion with a wife or a significant other, and then you're trying mm -hmm. to drag somebody else along who wasn't involved in the marketing. Yeah. So how have you guys really um, attacked that? What have you found to work? Maybe what have you found that's been hard that hasn't worked? Sure. There's two ways that I look at this. Um, first one is just in general, just our general experience. And I'll kind of use our firm as an example. And then the other way is just me personally, when I'm talking to people. Um, and I think that with both those lenses, we'll get something, some nuggets out of there that people will find useful. Um, the first one I'll say is that this marketing effort does not work in each office. Uh, we've had other planners try it and it falls flat on its face. Same, same, same presentation, same general, um, I don't like the word script, but like same general guidelines around what's said and how things are articulated, the certain areas where we need to be sensitive and the key takeaways that we want to convey to that audience hasn't, I mean, flat out has not worked. I mean, zero first meetings out of events that had 30 or 40 people in it. Um, and so it doesn't work everywhere or it doesn't work with everyone. I'm not sure whether it's the, the, the geography or um, if it's the individuals. Um, so because of that, we've, we've had to be pretty selective about where we use this. Um, and the second one, so that's kind of the, the external lens is that I don't be surprised if it doesn't work in your market for one reason or another. You're smarter on that than I am uh, to be able to get to the bottom of, of why that might be. And I'd actually be really curious to hear your thoughts on that. The second one around just me personally, um, I think the critical part of, frankly, any time you're talking about someone's funds is uh, you've got to be sincere. If you're out there to actually help people and not there to just sell them something, um, if it's just a quota thing, maybe that works from a transactional standpoint of you know, small pockets of money and you can convey the features and the benefits and then they'll buy it and then it's the end of the relationship for us. If you're not sincerely interested in helping someone improve um, or build, improve their financial state or accomplish some specific goals or really just have a long term 30, 40 year retirement, um, give them the security that they need. If you can't be sincere about that, it's not going to work in general, but I'd say that it's even more um, in, important that it's a sincere um, interest in helping people beyond just the dollars um, when you're talking to a female audience. I, that, that's come through again and again. So that sincerity is, has to be there. Um, and I'm kind of lucky in this one in that um, I, I actually, I've, I think I've always worked well um, with, with female clients or something by mm -hmm. uh, some of the ones that I actually consider dear friends um, are our clients. Um, and so that's always been natural, has a little bit to do with my upbringing, um, you know, single mom for a good portion of my life and um, being able to, to, to see the financial struggles that, that came along with that. Um, and then also being able to, that really did set me up to be quite literally where I'm at today in, in this, in this chair. So that's always been a very natural conversation, even beyond a digital, uh, a digital environment. So I've, I've always worked well with that audience. And so when the digital one came around, I was like, oh, this might actually work really well. It might be something I'm really interested in sharing with people. Um, now when it comes to bringing on a spouse, I've actually, I, I saw that a lot in the dinner presentations too. Um, because as a general rule, if, if um, a, a woman came to a, a dinner event, um, and then also translates over to the, the webinars as well, they're the planners. They're the ones that want to engage. They're the ones that have the lower ego uh, around being, you know, I'm 40 years managing my own portfolio. That's a guy talking to you. Um, just in, it's going to be a guy. Uh, and those are a lot harder um, when you're talking about something that you've done professionally for years and you know that they're not seeing the full picture. Um, 
but I found that in just talking to a female audience, um, they are more receptive to a message and they just are interested in getting uh, a bit more control. I mean, later today, um, I, I have one of the people that came on for a, a first just phone call is uh, a, a woman and um, she, she's like, well, I'm going to try and talk my husband onto being in the next one because I think this is really important. And, you know, so you counted that a little bit, um, but it hasn't been a huge barrier um, okay. to get a husband on or uh, a significant other on that was less uh, engaged. Not to say that's always the case because there's another one, I'd love to come on as a client, but he just, the, the guy just won't entertain any conversations whatsoever. <laughs> yeah. So. That's cool. That's interesting. And I think, uh, I think it is cool. I, th I think one thing I picked up on there, Brad, is you brought in your personal experience and you know, how this, how your background and really your life has kind of created this opportunity and this uh, propensity to be able to have mm -hmm. those conversations effectively. But I think um, telling stories inside of these, not just in the, in the webinars themselves, but also in, in your meetings is probably a really critical part of engaging that like yeah. personal human element there. And I think that that's something that translates to this marketing as well. Right. Right. I see a quick question on um, just like these initial phone calls. I think from a marketing standpoint, when we're trying to get somebody from like behind a desk in their basement to like yeah. engaging one-to-one -one with an advisor, one of the things we found really quickly is that going directly to like your traditional one hour, like initial consultation was a big mm -hmm. gap to cross. And yeah. so as a result, the number one thing we've changed is, you know, going to this 15 minute kind of discovery call, booking that through an online app like Calendly or Acuity or something like that. Um, that seems to be working pretty well from my end, as far as when I look at data and I say, how many people registered, how many people showed mm -hmm. and how many people clicked call to action. But I'd love to hear just a little bit about when you're on that call, especially yeah. that 15 minute intro call what does that call like? Is it, is it actually 15 minutes? Is it more like 30 minutes? Are people on that call to pick your brain and then bail or like, what's that conversion rate from that yeah. call into it? And just kind of what strategy you're applying, how are you really positioning that and how's that gone? Yeah. Um, the 15 minute call has been key. Um, people don't want to engage with you. Uh, with a full commitment uh, to, to, to start planning out their retirement when they hardly know you at all. Um, there is something that was interesting enough that they want to get on your calendar, but they don't know if this is a fit. They're just some guy from the internet. Um, so being sensitive to that with the first call in how you talk to it on the presentation, how you set up the agenda for the call when you're first talking to them in that, in that meeting once they've actually signed up. Um, in general, how those meetings go, I always let them know a time up front. So I say, look, I, I schedule these. I tell you it's a 15-minute phone call, just so you know, on my end. I always block off 30 minutes because they almost always go over. Um, mm -hmm. So I try to hold it to 15 minutes if we can, but if we find that there's more information you want to talk about, then we'll go into 30 minutes. It always goes 30 minutes. I mean, if sometimes if I don't have a and open, if it's a really good conversation, it'll go even longer. Again, this is a personal weakness of mine as a planner. Um, when I get into a conversation with something on a topic that I find interesting, it goes, um, mm -hmm. which some people have told me it's, uh, it's not a good thing. I need to be a little bit more specific on the timing, but sometimes it's just natural. So um, 15 minutes, I try. Uh, 30 minutes is normal. Um, now, in terms of stick rate for moving on to the actual engagement after that phone call, um, I found that I'm the one that's sort of in control of that. Uh, if someone's a good fit, it's pretty easy to show them in that 15 minutes why it's worth their time to at least explore. I mean, they don't know what they don't know. I don't know what I don't know. We don't charge anything for our planning phase. So uh, making that really clear to people that look, we're in a really interesting time. I have a specific set of expertise and um, information to share and there's really no upfront commitment. And in the end, they're the ones with the decision power. If they want to become a client, great. If they don't, then we'll you know, digitally shake hands and stay in touch. And maybe in a couple of years, it'll work out. But making sure that people understand that it's a pretty low commitment to go on and actually have a formal alignment meeting um, down the road is only going to benefit them. Mm -hmm. um, and from my perspective, it's not a fit for them. It's not a fit for me. So making sure they know that. Um, I, I think I've I've very, as opposed to dinner seminars, where a lot of people will come through my office for a first visit, and I want them to go into the second, but they walk out, and for reasons unbeknownst to me, I never hear from them again. I think it's a great meeting. Wow, I'm really excited. It's a great fit. I really like this person. They fit with other clients I have. Never come back. I, I hate that. It always drives me crazy. 
with digital, I found if someone is able to get on a phone call and interested in getting on a phone call and it's a good conversation, then getting to an actual planning visit is pretty natural. Um, it doesn't feel forced or like I'm really talking them into it or, you know, I don't have to say things the right way just to get them to that. It's kind of like, yeah, this makes sense. Let's just talk. Um, so having that low commitment barrier makes for a really efficient moving into the, the formal planning. But then again, the biggest one, the biggest benefit I get out of that 15 minute phone call is it's a filtering. Uh, just a lot, I recognize that a lot of people I talk to, I'm just gonna have to give them some quick advice. Um, they're not ready to retire, they need to keep working. Um, you name the reason I come across it. So more often than not, getting someone engaged in an actual planning process is um, something I'm more in control of um, than being on the receiving end of getting interest from someone. Interesting. That's super good feedback. I think that's something people are really going to value. Um, I'm going to shift just a little bit. I want to talk about just, and this is more of a re, like personal reaction yeah. kind of gut, but we're, I don't know, it seemed to me like March was, March and April were like two years long and then May, June and July was like two weeks long. And it just seems like yeah. this year has been really long and really short all at once. And you yeah. know, right now it's October 8th and it's hard to believe that we're, you know, whatever, eight months into this thing. Um, where are your clients at right now? And I guess I'm just kind of asking generally, how concerned are people with the market? How concerned are people with the virus? It, it, all of these things that are affecting our life. I know there's things going on with politics. We're in an election year. There was the debate last night. Um, what are you sensing from people? Are you feeling like people are wanting to like revert to what's normal? Um, and, and I guess kind of like the longer term implications of this is like, our webinar is going to play a role in our practice yeah. going forward, but just in general. Yeah. Yeah. In general for now, barring all the ones where it's not a fit, but for the people that are a fit, I'm getting two types right now. Uh, the first one is people that feel like they've got a new lease on life. Um, they, they saw their portfolios down 20%. If they were conservative 30, 40% in a lot of cases for people that hadn't properly adjusted their portfolio to meet their risk tolerance. Um, and a lot of people just went to cash then and, no conversation about finances was productive. You just mm. say, hunker down, stop talking to me, ouch, I hurt. Even though they need it, they would much rather lick their wounds and kind of emerge when they feel comfortable. So you get mm. those kind of hunker down people. That's what I experienced in March and April, um, even into June. Um, but this new lease on life cohort that's moving through is seeing their portfolio back to value or back back to where it was before, near where it was before, or maybe they're in cash and they've seen that they've missed out on the, the uptrend. Those people are um, interested in, the common question is just, how do I invest in this market? Mm -hmm. I, I don't know how to invest in this market. And that's kind of the driving conversation that we have. Um, so that's, that's one group, uh, the new lease on life group. Um, excited that they've seen the recovery and it's been so much more acute, so much more, such a shorter amount of time that it's like people still remember the drop and then they remember the gain and they're like, oh, this is so real. It's so tangible. <laughs> um, as opposed to, uh, you know, a year and the average drawdown, uh, la average bear market lasts like 17 months or something with a couple bear traps or bull traps in there. Um, and uh, so, so the new lease on life folks, those are great because they're really good opportunity to, to get someone's risk adjusted to what they actually want for the long run and they realize it. The other groups, the other group that I'm working through, it's a lot harder is the hurry up and wait folks. Um, they really want to plan. They really want to engage. They really like it. They, they remember everything just as the, the new lease on life folks, um, have, but the, the hurry up and wait people want to get a plan. They want to see it, but then they say, well, I'm not doing anything until the election's over. You know, like, or, or what's going to happen when, you know, if, if Biden gets elected or Trump gets reelected, um, what does that mean for the economy? And, um, and, and these are the people that just want to, they just want to stay out. Um, I also get with that group, a lot of people that are just mistrustful of the recovery in general mm -hmm. um, and are very concerned about any investment in a market where the economy is so um, confusing. Um how can we have a sustained economic recovery when they're still talking about trillions of dollars of stimulus just to prop us up? And what does that mean for long-term? Um, those people, it's a little harder to talk productively about the importance of downside controls on one end, but also not missing out on the growth side. So, you know, there's some ways that we can help work through that. But in the end, if, if someone's kind of a doomsdayer, um, 
we're just mistrustful of what we're going through. It's, it's going to be more like a three to six month time period and they could miss out on a big recovery, but who knows, maybe they'll be the smartest person in the room when I'm talking to them and they say, let's hold off. Right. Right. Cool. All right, man. Well, we're pretty close to our time here. I have two quick questions that are more kind of personal questions. Um, I just know from, you know, having talked to Ray who you're working with closely in our office and reading on your site, you're a big reader. Um, mm -hmm. Is there anything that you picked up during the lockdown that you've just really enjoyed um, and, yeah. and other people that you like? Yeah, I've always got a, a solid reading list going. Um, there is a, so I'm, I'm, uh, Ray Dalio, always an investment guy uh, that I've followed for years. Um, he came out with a book that is super trendy. Everyone should read it because it is good, but um, he made it free. It's called Principles. Um, which good enough on its own right, read that one a few months ago, but he mentioned two books in there that I decided to pick up that were awesome to read in this time. Um, one of them was The Lessons of History. So if you know Ray Dalio, he, he is a big believer that um, everything happens over and over again, uh, that nothing is actually new. You have hmm. the same versions of the current economy happen all the way back into Roman times, Egyptian times, going back for thousands and thousands of years. So he came out with a book called Lessons of History. No, he didn't come out with it. Sorry. He recommended a book uh, called Lessons of History. It's pretty cool. It was really neat as they went back and uh, way, way, way far, just total. Uh, and they just draw the common threads, just the unifying traits that you see across different types of governments, different types of, of economies, things like that. So that was a really good one. Uh, you recommended another one that's called The Hero with a Thousand Faces. Um, that's similar concept in that there's some threads um, that are common across all of humanity in the stories that we tell. So they go through thousands, literally thousands of different um, uh, myths, mythological heroes from Hercules to you know some uh, Eastern, uh, Eastern religions, talk a lot about Buddha and all the famous story, any famous story you've ever heard, even on the ones like Cinderella. Um, and they, he's identifying the common threads that they all share. And he's getting into the reasons why symbology and, and um, why they can actually mean something more than what it is um, because of these commonalities across all these different cultures. So there a hero with a thousand faces and lessons of history recommended. Awesome. Those are awesome. Cool, man. And I know you're a super active guy, um, done Ironman triathlons and that. Are you able to do any of that right now? I'm not sure exactly what's going on in California, but are you uh, running and everything right now? Yeah, trying. I mean, a two-year-old makes that tough, but uh, the, the Peloton, we were lucky to, to get our Peloton delivered um, just before uh, the lockdowns, which is when every, all those, I don't even know, they're probably still in back order. So Peloton has been really great. Um, the fires definitely put a hold on, on any outdoor running. So, uh, but we've got some pretty clear air. So I, I just went for a run yesterday. Uh, got a cool. race in June. So I need to get my butt in gear. Awesome. Cool, dude. Well, hey, man, I super appreciate it. I know this is something that's not just helpful for me. I've really enjoyed talking to you, but I think that your advisors across the country, your peers are definitely going to benefit from this as well. Um, so thanks so much, man. And really appreciate your time here. Yeah, sure thing. Thanks for all your help. Uh, and, and make sure to tell Ray, thank you too, because uh, you guys have been a, a really big help for us at a time when we really didn't know what we were doing early on. So we still don't know what we're doing, but I think we know a little more than we did.